Hey, I was thinking about um, uh, Friday, and, and everybody loves Friday, don't they? Friday is just a really exciting day, generally, for people. I remember when I was a kid, Friday was a really exciting day. And, and, and the reason that Friday was a really exciting day was because I knew that, that, that school was finished, and it was time to have fun. The hard work of the week was over, and it was now time to rest. It was now time to relax. When, when I left school, uh, I got saved at 19, ended up getting a job at a place called Sunny Brand Chickens. Anyone remember Sunny Brand Chickens at Byron Bay? I used to work at Sunny Brand Chickens. I used to cut bones out of dead chickens. And, and it was a great place to work, awesome place to work. A lovely uh, gentleman from the Uniting Church in Ballina, when I got saved, he said, we've got a job here. If you'd like it, you can have it. I got my job at Sunny Brand Chickens. But, but I worked during the week, and then I'd finish at 2.30 on Friday. And you know what? It was so great because I knew once work finished... I'm entering into this place of play, of fun, recreation. All the hard work had been done. It's almost like the weekend became this release of a pressure valve. Anyone, anyone still feel like that? You get to Friday and the pressure valve. All the steam comes out because you're just going to be able to go and rest, relax, recuperate, regenerate and have some fun and do whatever it is that you want to do. Uh, I was reading a survey recently about days of the week, because sometimes my brain goes all kinds of weird places. And so I'm sitting there, so I Google, I wonder what the best day of the week is. And so I, that's how I type. Anyone else type like that? I'm typing. Last week I typed like this. This week I typed like that. And so what I did is I typed into Google, what's the most popular day of the week? And the most popular day of the week, guess what? It's actually Saturday by about 1% or 2% over Friday. And that's only because obviously half of Friday you're still working and so on, but the end of Friday you get to rest, you get to relax, you get to go play sport, you get to do all those things that you want to do. You get to cease from all the striving and the hard work that you did up until Friday and you get to recuperate a little bit over the weekend. So Friday is one of the most popular days of the week for that reason. In fact, how many songs have there been made over the years about Friday? Anyone ever Googled that? That's another silly thing I Googled. How many songs have been popular songs about Friday? There's 72, just in case you're wondering, 72 of them. 72 popular songs that have been released that have Friday in the title that are about Friday. Anyone remember any of those? Friday on my mind by the Easy Beats was a big one. Anyone think of any other Friday songs? Yep. Yep, that, yep that's a good one. It's Friday, Friday. Hey, hey. Monday, Monday, Monday. Uh, Monday, Monday. Theo, you're listening to the wrong message. <laughs> Again. You know what my favourite song was when I was young? My favourite song about Friday was a song by a band called The Cure. Anyone remember The Cure? Remember The Cure? Yeah? And they had a song called Friday, I'm in Love. Do you remember that one? I don't care if Monday's blue, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday too, whatever. Thursday, I don't care about you. It's Friday, I'm in love. A lot of songs about Friday. Friday's a day of celebration. That's why I love what Jackie said at the, the, the beginning of the service, that, that, that Friday really is a day of celebration for us as Christians because God did something for us on this day. And, and I'm not saying, you know, don't walk out and go, hey, so today was... Oh, no one really knows what day of the week it was, but this is the day we celebrate it, okay? Now, what we do know is that God did something for us on this day that we're remembering today. God did something for us that we could not do for ourselves, and that's worth getting excited about, and I think that's worth celebrating. We're not just remembering a good Friday today. We're actually remembering the best Friday ever. We're here to remember and reflect on the greatest Friday in the history of Fridays. There's never been a Friday like it. The greatest Friday that there's ever been. Never has been, never will be. It doesn't matter what you've got planned coming up for this Friday, as in next Friday, or the Friday after, doesn't matter what. You'll never have a better Friday than the Friday that God gave us 2,000 years ago that we're here to celebrate and that we're here to remember today. Today we're remembering the moment in human history when sin was finally dealt with. Amen? It was finally dealt with. No more Old Testament sacrifices. Remember they used to uh, have the system where they would come along and uh, me and Jackie would, would go to the... the the, the, the festival and we'd have our sacrifices done for the sins and everything like that and then at the end of the festival I'd go my way and Jackie would go her way because we weren't married back then but we'd go our separate ways and before we left I'd say to Jackie well that was great well hey I'll see you again in another year you know what because I'm going to sin again we're going to be back here where we started doing it all over again again and again and again and we would keep coming back and we would keep offering sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice till one day 
there was a sacrifice to end all sacrifices. One day something happened that never had to be repeated ever again. Nor could it ever be repeated again. 1 Peter 3.18, Peter writes this. He says, For Christ also suffered once for sins. How many times? How many? Once for what? Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. So we're here to remember today that Christ suffered once, once for sins, to bring us to God. Paul puts it this way in his letter to the Romans, in Romans 6.10, he says, The death he died, he died to sin, how many times? Once for all. Jesus died once for sin, for all. The writer of Hebrews in 9.28 says this, So Christ was sacrificed, how many times? Once. To take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin. Why won't he bear sin a second time? You can't bear the sin of the world a second time. It only happens once. It only happens once. And that's what we're here to remember, that 2,000 years ago something happened once that will never be repeated, does not need to be repeated, and was so powerful that 2,000 years later, what happened there reverberates undiluted throughout human history. And can be received and accepted by anyone, any tribe, any nation, any tongue, any background, at any time, in any place. That's how powerful the sacrifice of Jesus was. Everything that needed to be done and everything that could be done to remove the barrier of sin between us and God took place on Friday. Took place on Friday and that's what we're here to remember 2,000 years ago. And that's why it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter where you're from, it doesn't matter what you have done. What Jesus did on that cross 2,000 years ago has the power to transform your life right now like it did the original 12 disciples. Like it did the first ever person who accepted that what Jesus did on the cross was for them. It's the power to change your life. It doesn't matter what you've done. I remember being on a boat once uh, many years ago. I used to go to the Solomon Islands a lot. And I remember being on a boat one time. We went across to the island called Malaita and we were doing some work with some villages and different places there. And when we were finished there, we were catching a, uh, a boat from Malaita back across to, uh, to Guadalcanal, the mainland of, of the Solomon Islands. And it was just after. Who remembers the, the, um, the civil war that broke out some years back in the islands? Anyone familiar with the islands? Yeah. What happened was the, 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 the people on Guadalcanal uh, went rogue on the Malaitans. The Malaitans came across and were taking some of their jobs. They weren't necessarily taking it. They were just putting their hand up doing work. And there was this tension between the Guadalcanal people and the Malaitans. And it ended with them just... Violent war broke out. A civil war broke out. And they were just killing each other in the streets. Terrible, terrible blood. I used to go to the islands years before that and they were the most friendliest, happiest people I'd ever seen. Everyone was smiling. Everybody knew everybody. It was just, it was like paradise on earth without all the technology. When I went back after the Civil War, it was a totally different place. Everybody, uh, nobody smiled. Everybody would walk past somebody and they would be watching as they walked past because they didn't know whether they'd harmed someone in that, someone, one, one of their family members or something and that there would be a reprisal. So people are walking like this, watching each other, making sure there's distance before they relaxed and turned back. It was totally changed the fabric of the nation. And we were on this boat coming back and one of the team members got into a conversation with a, a young man on the boat. And he was sharing with this young man about, for God's son loved the world that he gave his only son, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, the power of what happened on Friday, that you can be cleansed of your sins, you can be forgiven for all the things you've done, doesn't matter what it is. And this young man looked at him and said, God couldn't forgive me. And this team member said, yes, he can. Yes, he can. You don't understand the power of the blood of Jesus. And this young boy welled up with tears and looked back at the team member and said to him, no, 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 you don't understand what I've done. And then he held his hands out and he said, I've got blood on my hands. And this team member said to him, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what mistakes you've made. The blood of Jesus is there. What Jesus did on that cross 2,000 years ago is so powerful that it doesn't matter what you do in the future, it can never nullify the power of that if you'll just surrender to it. No sin you could ever commit is greater than the power of the forgiveness of Jesus Christ that was released when he, the final sacrifice, the final lamb ever to be slain, paid the price for your sins and mine. We generally reserve Sunday for the celebration, but Friday is really the day where it all took place. It says in Matthew 27, verse 51, it says at that moment, this is when Jesus breathed his last breath. Everyone remember the story? 
Jesus breathed his last breath. It says, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. Most of you would be familiar with the Old Testament and the sacrifices and all the stuff that goes on there and in the temple and the Holy of Holies and this massive big curtain about as thick as a phone book that separated the rest of us every day, Joe Blows, from God. And the high priest could go in there once a year and offer sacrifices. They'd actually put a tire chain to his leg when he went in there because if he went in there with sin in his life and dropped dead, they had to drag him out. They couldn't even go in to get him. That's how, that, that's how holy God was and how unholy we were and that curtain of separation that kept us apart. It says when Jesus died on that cross that something amazing happened. It says that that curtain that was as thick as a phone book tore in half from top to bottom. All of a sudden, that barrier, that thing that was between us and God was removed. The thing that stopped everyone, you, me, getting into the actual presence of God, talking face to face with God, being with God, experiencing God. That barrier was literally torn in half, it says, from top to bottom. I love that picture, imagery of top to bottom. It's like it's too high for us to reach and God knew that, so God had to do it for us. So he reached down and just went... It's gone. You can have a relationship with me again. In John 19, verse 30, John writes this. He says, When he had received the drink, speaking of Jesus, just as he's about to die on the cross, Jesus said these words. He said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head. And he gave up his spirit. It's interesting that Jesus didn't say, now I'm finished. <laughs> that, I would have been saying that, oh, I'm finished. But Jesus wasn't thinking about himself or talking about himself. He was talking about the task that he came to this earth for. John the Baptist gave us a heads up way back at the beginning. Remember John said, hey, look at that, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And everybody listening at that time would have understood exactly what he was saying. Because they sacrificed things all the time for sin. The difference was that they could only cover up sin. The blood of animals and goats covered sin. It could never remove sin. My dad used to have um, uh, an XA Falcon many, many years ago when I was a young boy. Anyone got an XA Falcon? Didn't think so. (laughs) You know how I know that? Because we had one. He decided one day that he was going to sand the whole thing back. It was full of rust, you see. He had rust pockets coming up everywhere. So my dad's a sort of a jack-of-all-trades, master and none. He can do everything, but he's got no tickets. So what he did is he just began this process of stripping his car down, sanded the entire car back, and then he painted it. Remember, remember Kill Rust? Anyone know what that, kill, that ugly sort of Kill Rust colour? Anyway, he painted the whole car with Kill Rust with the intention, of course, of then painting over it. Well, he did such a great job painting it with Kill Rust, he left it as Kill Rust colour. <laughs> And so for the next three, four years, we drove around an XA Falcon that was just kill rust. It was embarrassing. Just embarrassing. But you see, he removed all the rust so that then you could paint over the top of it and it would have been fine. And I think that's a good picture of the difference between what the blood of Jesus did and what the blood of goats and animals did. The blood of goats and animals, it was like this big patch of rust was there. And what we did, though, is we just painted over the top of it. So the rust was still there. It wasn't dealt with. It was just covered over. Eventually, it's still going to come through, but it's just covered over. So we keep coming back, and we do another coat of paint. We come back, we do another coat of paint. Every time the rust comes through, we do another coat of paint, another coat of paint. The difference between the blood of animals and the blood of Jesus is that Jesus didn't just cover sin. It says he took it away. He took away the power of sin. Now, does that mean we don't sin? Who doesn't sin in this room? I still struggle. I don't really have an excuse for it anymore because I've been set free from the power of it. But I still make dumb choices and I still submit myself every now and then and I still make mistakes. But the mercy and the grace of God is there for me. But every time I make a mistake, I don't have to re-crucify Jesus, do I? I don't beg for forgiveness. I come humbly back before the Lord, admit what I've done is wrong and accept the forgiveness that he gave me 2,000 years ago through the death of Christ on the cross. Jesus said, now it is finished, not I am finished. Literally, the task I came to do, to take away the sin of the world, to remove the barrier between you and God, that task has been completed. It's now over. 2,000 years ago, everything that was needed to be done to remove that barrier of sin between you and God took place then. And that's what we remember on Good Friday. The, 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 the word that we have translated, it is finished, it's one Greek word. It's the Greek word to telestai. 
And here's what it literally means. It literally means this. It means that it is finished in the past, it is finished in the present, and it is finished in the future. It's not a, it's not a it is finished in this moment, that's it, full stop. It's, it's a word that, that has present tense about it that continues on and literally means that I finished it right now. It's finished in the present. It's been finished for the past. It's been finished for the future. In other words, what Jesus did on the cross does not dilute over time. It doesn't get weaker over time, does it? We've got this termite barrier around our house. Anyone got a termite barrier around their house? Yep. Now, hands up, because I want to talk to you afterwards, see if I can get a cheaper deal. Because they're expensive suckers to have. And you know what annoys me about the termite barrier? You pay all this money, they come and drill the holes in the ground, put the liquid in and so on, but then they tell you the minute it's put in, we'll be back in three years' time, we'll take another 50000 off you because it's going to be diluted. What? What do you mean it's going to be diluted? I want you to fix it. I'm going to pay all that money. I want to know that. No, 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 it's going to be diluted. So they tell you up front, this thing's only going to last three years. After three years, you're going to have to do something about it. You know, I reckon some people feel that way when it comes to their own sins. Some of us still live as if the power of God and the blood of Jesus over time has become diluted. And yes, it's, it's great that, that he died for me and I accept that, but I've got to do something else to add to that. Anyone know any people like that? It's the blood of Jesus plus in order to make me right with God. It's the blood of Jesus plus something else. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11 and 12. I love this verse because I think it gives a bit of an image, a bit of a picture of what I'm saying. It says that day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Think about that for a second. Day after day, every priest performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can what? Never take away sin. Doesn't that have a little bit of a hint of perhaps how some people live out their Christian faith today. We are the priests, and we're still daily doing things that we think will help take away our sins and make us right with God because we don't have a full revelation and understanding of the power of the sacrifice of Jesus to deal with sin. That moment in human history that cannot be repeated doesn't need to be repeated and change the world forever. When I gave my life to Christ at 19, he wasn't being sacrificed there. What he did 2,000 years ago, the power of that carried right throughout time and it was as if I was right there in that moment kneeling at the cross accepting what he did for me. It wasn't a kind of forgiveness, a type of forgiveness, a partial forgiveness. I was forgiven. Full stop. And there was nothing I could add to that. Nothing I could do to make him love me more. Nothing I could do to get him to be more for me. Uh, years ago, I've shared this story with some of you, but when me and my wife first started dating, um, I was not the hip, fab, groovy, cool, trendy dresser that you see before you right now. Whoa. I know, shock horror, but it's true. I used to look like a real dag. I used to wear no shoes, pair of shorts. I never wore a shirt unless I had to, and I had a mullet. Anyone got a mullet? They will come back. I don't care what my hairdresser wife says, mullets will come back. But I remember one day we were going to a wedding, and here's what happened. We were getting ready to go to this wedding, right? And I was out mowing lawns or something, and it was the first, I think it might have even been our first date, actually, where we went something, somewhere as an official boyfriend or girlfriend. And so I'm out working, and I come back, and I was living in a caravan on a YWAM property over the south side of Brisbane, and I came back, and I opened up the caravan door, and I walk into my van, and there on my bed was laid out this... Um, beautiful collared shirt and a pair of black slacks and, you know, just really, like, nice clothes. I hadn't seen these things before. Where did they come from? Well, without getting into too much detail, my wife illegally broke into my van and put them on my bed. But the Lord forgives. (laughs) Quicker than I do. Anyway, she put these clothes there, and I'm, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I'm not the dumbest either. And so I looked at that, and I thought, ah, oh, I know what she's trying to say. I get it. I read between the lines here. She's wanting me to wear these clothes, you know? <laughs> so you know what I did? I put those clothes on, and we went out and had a great time at the wedding and our first date, and never forgot it. But you know what's interesting? If I thought putting on, I had to put on those clothes to get her to love me, I wouldn't have done it. It would have been too much hard work. 
I wonder sometimes with our daily sacrifices, how many Christians feel like reading the Bible every day is an added on to the blood of Jesus so that God will accept me and God will continue to love me. So I better read the Bible every day. It's a religious duty. It's not a life-giving thing. It's a religious duty. I've got to pray every day. I've got to have quite time to pray with God every day. Not, 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 not as a, a loving response, but it's really a religious duty because I'm hoping that it'll get God's attention. I'm hoping he'll see how much I love him back and he'll love me more. And I can really experience the forgiveness of God because I'm not quite sure. And I don't really understand. I don't think that the blood of Jesus was enough. So I've got to add these religious duties and these things on top of it to make sure that I'm right with God. I've got to come to church every week. They're all good things. I've got to give. I mean, I give lots of money to charity and lots of money to the church, and I do all these things. You know what the difference between religion and life is? It's, it's, it's motivation, isn't it? See, I didn't put those clothes on to try to get Jackie to love me. I put those clothes on as a loving response to a love I already had because I knew she loved me unconditionally. She loved me with a mullet, this woman did. Now, that's saying something, isn't it, ladies? Amen. She loved me with a mullet. She loved me without shoes. She loved me with my, my, my no shirt and my baggy shorts. She loved me as I was. I love, um, I'm trying to remember his name again. Um, Brennan Manning. Brennan Manning. Anyone ever read any of Brennan Manning's stuff? I love Brennan Manning. Amazing, amazing uh, human being. Amazing minister of God. But he made a statement one day and he said this. He said, God loves us as we are and not as we should be for none of us uh, as we should be. How many of us are still like those priests? We're daily performing sacrifices because we're still trying to get God to love us unconditionally. Friday is a reminder to us. God loves you unconditionally. And the forgiveness that Jesus offers us is unconditional forgiveness. The forgiveness that he gives to you. The, the, the blood of Jesus covered your sin, past present and future. That doesn't mean that we can go and live however we want. Unconditional love does not mean unconditional acceptance of anything you want to do. Unconditional love means that God loves us as we are and calls for that loving response back as we surrender our life to him. Question that I want to ask you today is how many of us are living in the forgiveness of God? How many of us truly embrace the fact that God has forgiven us and that there's life in Jesus? And how many of us are still trying in our own subtle ways to get forgiveness from God with our religious duties and the things that we're doing? If, that, if we're doing that, it's because we don't fully comprehend what happened on Friday. Jesus died for us on Friday. Why do we love Friday? Because it's the realisation that we also can cease from our striving. It's the realisation we can also cease from all of our work. It's the realisation that after Friday, we can enter into rest and peace with God. Amen? No more works on our part. We can enter into the rest of God by faith. We're about to take communion together. And just before we get in our groups, I'll just leave you with Isaiah 53.5. There's all kinds of, I don't, I don't know what churches are all in this room here, but I do know this, that all different branches of faith have, very, uh, have their own interpretations of what happened on the cross. Some of us say that, that healing is guaranteed. Some people believe you, because of the cross, healing is guaranteed. Nobody should ever be sick. And if that's you, that's, that's fine. Some people believe that because of the cross, we should all be healthy, wealthy, and wise. And if we're not healthy and wealthy or wise, it must be unbelief or sin or something. I'm, I'm not, I don't want to touch any of that. That's between you, God, and what you believe. But there's one thing out of Isaiah's prophecy about Jesus that is undisputed, no matter what denomination or group you go to. Isaiah 53, 5, it says, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. If there's one thing we can all agree on about the death of Jesus, it's that he removed that barrier of sin, that wall of separation, so that each one of us 
can actually finally have peace with our maker. We can finally have peace with God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Don't forget the second part. God did not send his son to condemn the world. But that the world might have life through him. God offers us peace with himself through the sacrifice of Jesus. The responsibility comes back to us. Are we prepared by faith to accept that the cross was enough for us to be made right with God?